Hello, everybody. Welcome to Horace's uh, global meeting. Um, today, I'm joined by my esteemed uh, fellow panelists, and we'll be discussing the topic of uh, combating the growth of cyber threats. Um, this is probably the most impactful and relevant topics of our time. You know, just as for the entire world, we can categorize it as pre-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID. The same is true for the cybersecurity as well. You know, I, I can share many statistics that will show the, the, the damage of, of not addressing the core issues of cybersecurity and compliance at all levels. But at the end of the day, as the technology changes and the technology advances, so do cyber threats. Security and compliance are yet to become a culture for businesses, governments, societies, and communities. And mostly they are talked about after the fact. We rarely hear a good cybersecurity success story, but we do hear every day a ransomware attack. And we only hear the popular ones, whether it's Colonial Pipeline, whether it's JBS, whether it's Microsoft or any other, you know, uh, popular entity or popular event. There is a, every 11 seconds, there is a business that is attacked by ransomware. On the average, it takes 285 days to remediate. Annual cyber damages are expected to be about six trillion, whereas the spend is only two trillion, and that shows the gap, and we can do the math. And in the in the industrial age of 4.0, where the technology is accelerating at a much, much faster with the cloud first AI, IoT smart instrumentation everywhere. How do we deal with the parallel world that continues to also exist, which is it only exponentially opens up the, the, the security risk and security exposure. Today, you'll, you'll get to hear thoughts from several of, several of our esteemed panelists. From various levels, from you know businesses to boards to governments and to policy levels, how do we drive security at the same pace as technology, and how do we build a safer world for everybody together? So, with that said, um, I will let the panelists kind of introduce themselves and at the same time also take a few minutes and share their thoughts on the topic. Um, we'll start with uh, Carlos, Carlos Maria, it's based out of Geneva, Switzerland. Carlos, over to you. Thank you very much, Atash, and a pleasure to be with all of you. So. Um, I am the uh, founder and CEO of Wisekey. So Wisekey is a cybersecurity company in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, we have been very focused on three areas, mainly on cybersecurity and the encryption level, everything which is cryptography, root keys, and the possibility of verticalizing cybersecurity on the web. As we know, the web is not secure, and something needs to be added into the infrastructure in order to increase the current security level. Uh, the other area is semiconductors. We are very, uh, we are one of the leading semiconductor companies in Europe. Uh, we are working with uh, IoT, smart cities, 
connecting drones, connecting cars, connecting everything to the internet. Over one trillion objects are going to be connected to the internet in the years to come. Uh, we need cybersecurity and authentication for each of those objects. And the third leg of our development is on AI, as uh, we are entering into this data economy um, ecosystem, where terabytes or petabytes of AI data is being recorded on a daily basis. And you need to have, and you need to have um, sust sustainable technology that can analyze that data. So my previous background, I was in the UN in Geneva. As you know, the Geneva hosts the uh, international specialized agencies for the UN: WHO, ITU, uh, UNCTAD, the World Trade Organization, and others. And I have been serving the UN for 16 years as a security expert. So um, one of the uh, things I would like, and I let the other speaker just introduce themselves, or maybe we go later on the debate, but uh, one of my major focus has been how to harden the current World Wide Web. As you know, the World Wide Web was invented here in the city in Geneva by CERN, and uh, we witnessed that, that development from the beginning, and we realized how vulnerable uh, the Internet uh, was already, even before the web, how much it was becoming after the web. So uh, our major focus has been to harden the infrastructure and supplement the existing security the web can provide to us with other technologies such as PKI, artificial intelligence, and IoT. So I don't know if you want me to do, or you just go around the, the panel, and then we go more into substance. Satoshi? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. No, I think uh, please go ahead and uh, share your thoughts as well. Um, you know, and and then and then we'll we'll go into a debate session at the end. Okay. So so one of the uh, major issues that we are facing in, in the work we have been doing in the last years is that uh, the identity aspects. As you know, the uh, the, the web is is blind in what concerns identity. You don't have an identity layer being incorporated on the web. And um, digital identity uh, was a major uh, political issue. Many countries do see digital identity as the uh, political um, aspects of their deployment. They believe and, and they are right to believe that they need to own or control that digital identity process as you don't really want one country to provide a digital identity to another country. So digital identities are, are combined today between PKI cryptographic root keys and what now with addition of blockchain uh, allows both a vertical centralized model versus a decentralized model. Allows now with the technology we have to uh, localize digital identity at national level. So, uh, you know, in, in India with the Adhar project issuing 1.3 billion identities, e Europe just announced a few weeks ago a digital identity for all Europeans, which then will be used to uh, digitalize sign, for instance, COVID certificate or vaccination certificate. So, um, there is an international trend of countries issuing that digital identity. Now, the problem with digital identities, uh, they need to report to some kind of cryptographic root key capabilities. And that's what Weiski is. We are like very scientists in the United States or uh, Entros is in Canada. Uh, we are able through the cryptographic root key with a private key issue public uh, public keys. Then they are then inserted into mobile phone devices or anything that will allow the person to get an authenticated connection. So we believe uh, by bringing uh, the internet to a trusted infrastructure on where digital identity are going to be deployed, not by the platform, which is the case now, you have now Microsoft, Facebook, and many platforms creating some, something like a default or digital identity, but this is a, a major issue there is that those identities belong to the platform and not to the individual. Uh, or effort has been more to uh, empower the individual with its identity. So identity belongs to the individual and not to the platform. We have been working also with uh, at the policy level. I am also a founder of a NGO in Geneva with the name OISE, which is uh, a cryptographic root key foundation, which is in, uh, in, in very close cooperation with the UN and other international bodies in creating interoperability between those cryptographic root keys. Mm -hmm. So the vision of the future is that basically countries will like to uh, own that cryptographic root key at national level. Some of them, they are issuing their own cryptographic root key, like the case of India. 
but you would like, obviously, to be international compatible, to have interoperability. So this is a very big endeavor. Uh, it is a market which is now, for a time, being controlled by economic forces because a digital identity for a social media platform, it, it is a product. It is something that they know how to monetize. So they would prefer them to provide that than letting anybody else to do it without that uh, business, uh, business information. Uh, it is a layer which is essential in order to uh, reduce the current cybersecurity threats. A lot of the threats are, and you know, uh, because all of you have been working with this for many years, are, are, are low-hanging fruit threats for hackers, right? They enter into infrastructures, then they are not properly secure. And the identity is the first line of security, first line of protection. If you provide a strong authentication process before somebody can single sign on in a website, or you provide a verification KYC compliant process before letting somebody enter into that website, uh, or sending you an email, or you use digital certificate to secure that email you receive is from the right person, and you click, and then you see a window in your on your email software then shows uh, as, as a proof of evidence that that certificate, it is trusted by the operating system. Therefore, it is a trusted identity that is wanting to engage with you. Then you reduce substantially the risk, right? A lot of the risk is because we are still using the web and, 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 and the uh, websites in a very unsecure way. How many websites don't even have a HTTPS, uh, which will allow uh, an SSL connection between the uh, site and the user. So, so this is the major, uh, I will call the, the major, uh, you know, element that needs to be secure before we can even imagine on a reliable internet. Now, the the the, uh, the need is very urgent because, uh, as uh, as I mentioned before, and this is part of our of our work as well on IoT, one trillion objects are getting connected. Uh, Wiseki is helping companies like Parrot uh, for uh, authenticating their drones, where their drones are being um, uh, has been uh, conducted or piloted by a authenticated pilot and not by a hacker that will uh, entry uh, into the uh, drone security and basically be able to hijack the drone. Uh, the same thing with connected cars. We we provide security and technology that allows a, a car to connect to uh, their clouds and encrypt all the data both ways to the cloud so nobody can enter into that communication. We are also providing the same technology to uh, grids, uh, smart cities. One smart city, for instance, has something like one billion uh, secure elements, semiconductors, to be installed in a smart cities because the uh, the future is moving towards a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer interconnectiveness between things versus everything going to a um, centralized database, which is was the uh, previous model, right? So um, with the uh, arrival and the uh, reinforcement of uh, ledger technology, uh, we are able now to issue an identity for everything and then get that identity to verify in a blockchain ledger uh, as, a, as an attribute to that identity. So that decentralizes totally the process and, and basically reinforces the security because you can have many validation points in the infrastructure. Anyway, I just maybe stop here and um, just let those speak a bit. But thank you very much for that. I mean, you, you definitely are at the, at, the, at the core of all the innovation that needs to happen to, to improve the security. Uh, seems like we covered a wide spectrum of things there. Um, and I, I understand the importance of uh, national identity and its rollout, and with its, you know, all the security, you know, obligations that come in, as well. With that, um, I'd like to to go over to uh, Chris um, Chris Painter, who's joining us from Washington D.C. today. Chris, could you please uh, introduce yourself and share your thoughts as well? Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm Chris Painter. I spent a long time in the government uh, doing cyber stuff. Uh, about 28 years in the government doing that. So I was I was a federal prosecutor doing cyber crime before there was a World Wide Web. There was an internet, but the web hadn't quite been born yet. Uh, so I've seen a, a real growth and change in this area in terms of the threats. As a prosecutor, I was at the, uh, I helped uh, uh, run cyber at the National Security Council at the White House, and I was uh, uh, the first cyber diplomat, I guess, in the world uh, at the State Department. And now, among other things, I help run a nonprofit, and I'm on uh, a couple of boards to deal with cybersecurity issues. Um, look, I, I think as I look at this, and certainly this has been punctuated by what we've seen the last uh, couple of weeks, 
you know, one of the issues is cyber. We become so dependent on all these technologies, as was being said before, for almost everything we do. And certainly businesses are incredibly dependent on it for everything from just running the business uh, to, uh, you know, supply chain issues to uh, industrial control issues, really the whole range of, of issues. And we become e- even more dependent as time goes on. And yet we have not either invested the time or the resources to really secure that infrastructure, particularly uh, critical infrastructure, to the extent we need to. Now, there's lots of reasons for this. I'd, I'd say one of the big reasons is that, you know, despite all the things we read about in the news, this is still not a priority at the board level. It's not a priority in government at the uh, the prime minister and president and, and minister and, and secretary level, cabinet level, until recently. I think this has been changing. Um, and, and there's this view among policymakers, and I'd say among uh, you know board, uh, the C-suite too, that they look at cyber as this very technical thing that is the province and the responsibility of people other than them. That like you, you, you know, chief information security officer, you go handle this. I don't really understand this. I don't understand how this affects my business in the long term. And so that's been a problem. And the other problem I think is when we have news stories that say it's a wake up call. And I can't tell you how many reporters have said it's a wake up call. We've had so many wake up calls over the last 10 years or 20 years that it's like we're walking in our sleep. We wake up, we go back to sleep. We don't really pay attention to this in, in the way we need to. So, so I think, you know, where I see transformation recently, there's a couple of things. One, at the geopolitical level, there's a lot more attention on this issue internationally. And that's both because of the threats we've seen against elections in the U.S. and, and other places as well, uh, which really goes to the heart of our democratic systems, but also some of the big, uh, the big uh, incidents and hacks that we've seen uh, that I think has drawn people's attention, certainly. And in the, U- you know, in the U.S. at a political level, the Biden administration has said when they came in, this is fairly extraordinary, that cyber would be at the top of the agenda uh, at every level of the government, which is easy to say, harder to do, but you know they've actually followed that up with some, some good personnel and some good policies. Uh, at the international level, the UN, the policymaking part of the UN has been working on you know rules of the road for cyber. What are the acceptable, it's not a free fire space, what are the acceptable rules of the road? Things like countries shouldn't attack the critical infrastructure of another country absent wartime. wartime there are certain rules involved, what they call international humanitarian law, like, you know, don't go after civilian targets, et cetera. Uh, but in non-war time, that's where we see it. We don't have cyber war. People always talk about we're in cyber war. We're not in cyber war, but we're below that threshold, but we have very serious conduct. Um, and so, so there's been some good productive things in the UN talking about, you know, don't attack critical infrastructure, don't attack the, the computer emergency response teams. They're like the ambulances, the hospitals. Uh, work on supply chain of things. And that's great. When you get the US, China, Russia, and a m- number of other countries agreeing, that's wonderful. But one of the problems is there's not been accountability. E- even with all those you know, agreements, all those understandings about voluntary rules of the road, obviously we've seen an increase, uh, a steady increase in terms of the attacks, in terms of the, you know, the impact of these attacks uh, and intrusions, and they're very different intrusions for espionage are meant not to be seen, attacks are meant to be seen. So we've seen both. Um, and they really haven't abated. Uh, so having the rules alone doesn't do it. You need accountability. You need to hold people accountable. And we have not been good at that as countries or companies, really. And I think that's changing somewhat. Now, what's happened, I think, which is more of a watershed moment in the last few weeks, is when we have things like the colonial pipelines, a ransomware hack. And I should say I was also uh, a co-chair of a ransomware task force that issued just before the colonial pipeline hack happened. Uh, so that was good timing. Uh, a very comprehensive report with about 45 recommendations, everything from what we need to do internationally to how we have to go to, you know, have to deal with cryptocurrency to have to, how we have to go after safe havens to try to go after ransomware. But those attacks, unlike a lot of the cyber things we've seen in the past, when people can't get gas, it brings it home to them. When people can't get their hamburger because a meat plug was attacked, it brings it home to them. When hospitals are affected, I think it makes it more concrete for policymakers and for and for CEOs too. And so I think that will help drive the conversation, at least I hope it will, uh, so we have more sustained attention on this uh, because we really need to. I think if we don't do that, uh, we're going to see more of these events. We're going to see more of these kinds of both intrusions, like the big solar winds one, which stole information. It was espionage or these destructive attacks we see from ransomware groups. Um, you know, I, I might say one other thing. It is heartening to me, despite all these bad things, 
that this is getting more attention. So uh, the National Security Advisor in the U.S. said that President Biden is going to raise uh, ransomware and cyber at the G7, at NATO, at every, and then with Putin, obviously. I mean, I don't remember a time when this has gotten such high-level attention. Now, it's bad because it's gotten high-level attention because bad things have happened, but it's good because it's now getting the attention it deserves. And hopefully we can just demystify this idea that it's not just the province of, of you know, of geeks. It is the, really a core thing that needs, needs to be mainstreamed uh, for both governments and for industry uh, because it's going to be with us for a long time. This is not going away as an issue. Thank you, Chris. As you said, you know, it is, it is definitely encouraging to see the kind of attention um, that the, cyber, the cybersecurity and compliance overall is getting these days. And hopefully, as you said, you know, it is will lead to positive changes um, while, while they're not easy. So appreciate appreciate sharing your thoughts. Um, John, um, over to you, please. John Leggett is joining us from London today. John, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to meet. Um, my, my background is in the energy space for many years from oil and gas to power stations to other plants. Uh, in my time in BP, I was Chief Information Officer for about eight years in doing that and held under me the whole cybersecurity question. Um, that Chris said earlier he spent years becoming a, a cyber ambassador. I think my term on that would be being a cyber missionary, trying to explain to people and get the message over. And in most of my work nowadays, is at board level. And what I want to focus on is to how companies and corporations need to think about cyber as a piece of, I'll call it, executive responsibility. And that really is kind of what I want to focus on, not the technology dimension. Uh, and first of all, I think just on the scale of the problem, and uh, I think Santosh earlier mentioned 600 billion, I, I found a trillion somewhere else, so we can find any number you like that says it's very big indeed. And it can kind of moving towards representing 1% of the global economy. The combination of losses and precautionary measures come to kind of around a trillion. So it's very, very big. Um, and the point has been said, but I will reinforce, this is not an issue of email. It goes all the way through all the way we live our lives, our plant, our banking systems, Anything you can name has been progressively digitized in the last 20 years in ways that you wouldn't know. Uh, things are being automated everywhere. Uh, so in a sense, that's what you have to understand is the threat touches every piece of plant equipment you have uh, all the way through. And not often said, but as I understand it, from the point of view of the perpetrators of these crimes, the risk-reward model is quite favorable. There's limited chance of getting caught. The recoverability is poor. We make headlines of this billion and that billion, but really much of it goes unaddressed. And so if you're a player in that space, uh, you'll get away with it uh, in spite of best endeavors. And then finally, and this is probably an odd occurrence in the last few years, there's many market entrance actors who are unskilled, but you can buy all the tools you need. You can you can do your cash collection, you can do this, you can do that, and so you don't need very much to build it. So it's kind of ransomware as a service model has come of age, and it's pretty terrifying. So it means people can jump onto this whole story uh, without too much technology background uh, and make, make a reasonable go of it. So that's kind of a, a, this is my way of background and context. But in a corporate sense, I like to look at the other side, not technology, but what are the risks and exposures you have for so going the risk matrix? Is there a likelihood of a reputation damage for the wrong email being in the wrong hands? And, and we talked of colonial, is that a safety and an environmental question? If these pipelines get damaged, or shut down or spill. Uh, and corporations need to think about third parties. Who are the people in their ecosystem who may have leaks coming through? 
because most systems, supply chains especially, are connected across the globe. And so you try to understand the role of third parties and the potential of an inadvertent for causing leakage there. So, and I won't go too far into the, uh, but on the technology alone, I would say there's a couple of points to that. You've got to have continuous surveillance. You've always got to be examining what's going on everywhere. Uh, and look at that. And from where I sit with one company, they strongly prefer everything being encrypted uh, statically and in flight. And if you're not, then you have it coming, as they say, fully exposed. I mean, people need to think about that. And modern encryption, there are very many flavors of it, uh, can be easy to touch, easy to use. Uh, and with Global Integrity on, on the board, that's our speciality is low touch, but easy to use and deploy. And then, again, get your many companies still have stuff on premises. It needs to be in the cloud and made secure. But actually, having it in buildings is not a good idea. And then my final thing is, and this is from the executive point of view, uh, most board members think it won't happen to them or uh, it won't get very far. And what I did in BP, and I would recommend to anybody, is to run almost extreme scenario events. What's the worst you can think about? And then run that for a day or two days with your top team and bring in experts. But we often did that. And if you don't do it, you can presume all is well, but you will discover unrevealed faults. And you'll educate people as to what the issues are with that. Uh, and then as a final message, when it happens, have access to the smart people, the right kind of lawyers to do cyber, the right people who do cyber uh, forensics, and then if you want them, you can hire in uh, ransom negotiators on your behalf who speak Russian. Uh, so, you know, you ought to have all that stuff in your Rolodex before bad things happen. And let me leave it there and simply final of it, finally say, preparation, preparation is the message. Thank you, John. Um, you know, I must I must extend your thought and say we have a, a cyber innovator, ambassador, and a missionary on the panel today. So <laughs> it's a great combination to have. Um, you know, um, Carlos, and over to you for a comment. I know that you you are an author. Um, you've written the book Transhuman, I believe, where the idea is to give the the control of the data and the ownership and the benefits of the data to the person who, to whom it belongs to. Um, can, can, I'm just curious on, on the implications of, of that thought process and where do you think we are and the cybersecurity related implications of that? So oh, for some reason we can't, you're on mute by the way. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, so yeah, absolutely. We, we work with several universities, including MIT, on basically redefining the concept, what we call the transhuman code. So, so the idea is that we as a human, we have a code, and this code needs to be enhanced in order to enter into the fourth industrial revolution, which is what is happening now. I mean, all this uh, disruption that we are seeing everywhere, and COVID is just accelerating that disruption, is because actually we are entering into the fourth industrial revolution. So um, in that revolution, and again, go back again to the uh, origins of the uh, internet, the ARPANET, the web, the human was not designing the architecture. The web doesn't know what a human is. You remember, I'm sure all of you remember, because we have from that generation, this picture where it says, the web doesn't know you're a dog, right? So, so, um, so, so this is still is the case. The web doesn't know that we are humans. And humans uh, progress uh, lineal, so we have to go uh, step by step, year by year, generation by generation to absorb knowledge. And technology is exponential, so technology goes faster than what humans will be. So if, if that 
is the case, then we could be in a situation where we're going to be very soon a liability for the exponential growth of the technology. So the human is the problem, right? And if the human is the problem, the algorithm it will just replace the human and, and we just make the, the human uh, totally uh, redundant. So, so how can we solve that problem? And, and, and there's a need to solve that problem because maybe we are in the last generation, the last opportunity to do it right because, uh, you know, singularity is there and many processes are there that will uh, accelerate this, this problem I just described. And by the way, cybersecurity is, is also a consequence of that. You know, it, it's because the human is not being uh, factored into the infrastructure. Therefore, the human is being attacked. The attack of the human is because we never protected the human on the internet. So how we solve that? So, so there are three basic uh, building blocks um, that we describe in the book. Is one is to say that a digital identity is a human right. So, so it's not something that uh, has to be given to you by you providing personal data or whatever. No, digital identity is a human right. The day that you decide to enter into the internet, the web, in whatever capacity as a staff, as a government official, as a person, as a fan, as a soccer team or Amer American football fan, that day, it, that identity should be granted to you as an individual and you should own that identity and you should have the consent that that identity will, 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 will be associated with it. Consent is something that's not exist on the current internet infrastructure. So that means that users are giving consent by default. And once you give consent, then you don't get it back. You know, this is the kind of the abuses that you had in social media uh, by people getting their data, data mine with other knowledge. It's because the consent was given by default, right? So consent needs to be returned back again to the humans through the digital identity. And then we do what we do in normal life. I mean, if I invite you guys to my house for having a great dinner tomorrow, I will invite you once. I don't I mean that you have to come in every day from the next five years to my house to have a dinner, right? So, so that, that concept of consent does not exist on the Internet. So by giving back to the human the, the control of the consent, uh, we will create a, a, a new architecture for the World Wide Web and for the internet, and for what we call the uh, deep tech. Uh, because now what is happening is that technologies are converging. We are in a very similar model we were in the Renaissance, uh, where mathematics, uh, geography, architecture, all that combined into a cross-knowledge pool of data. We are in the same situation now. We, we are combining AI, blockchain, quantum computer uh, technologies, uh, identity management, all that is getting uh, converged. And that means that the new, new, new paradigm shifts are going to be emerging. But we need to architecture the identity of the human on the platform. And how we do that? So that is cryptographically. And I was uh, totally in agreement with what John say is uh, encrypt by default. Yes, that's the only way. By, by, and this is so easy, by the way. Encrypting by default is I do that every day on my email with my staff, regardless where they are. Encrypted by default is what I do every day on video calls, you know, because we want to be sure that those video calls cannot be intercepted. Encryption by default and identity management by default is what we do, for instance, when we do e-voting in Switzerland. Wiskin was the first company in the world to let Swiss people to vote from their mobile phones already 12 years ago, right? So, so identity by default, encryption by default, and ownership of that identity on the user with their consent empowers you the day that you don't want to use the internet anymore, that you retire from the internet, then you just, just want to spend the next years of your life just painting. That day, you just delete everything that has been posted and has been done with or without your consent because you control the identity. That's the internet we are building, and that's the internet actually blockchain is accelerating that process. Obviously, that has many... Uh, connotations, because if you look at from a uh, cybersecurity perspective, if you are a government, you will say, oh, wow, do I want to give the identity to everybody on their consent? Maybe not. But it shouldn't be the problem, because when you are, and, and again, the definition of identity is not your nationality, it's not your credit card, it's not your frequent flyer program, your identity is your PII, your personal identifier information, it's you. Your nationality is on the top of your identity. It's an attribute to the identity. Actually, identities are ruled by an international standard by ITU, which is the organization that does the 4G, 5G, and all the telecommunication standards, 
which is the X509. And, and in that, if everybody in the world will use that standard, you will see that the identity is totally decapsulated from the attribute. So you can have my Carlos Moreira identity, and this is my, my birth certificate on the internet, the day I enter into the internet with my identity, and then my nationality is an attribute the government will give to me, and my tax uh, identity and my bank identity will be attributes I'm, and I'm going to be adding to that PII. The day I lose that nationality because I get married with somebody else and I choose another nationality, that day I still uh, I am authorized to use my identity, right? The identity is not my nationality. Or the day I lose my bank account because I don't have the money anymore there, that day I don't lose my identity. Or the day I, 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 I move away from Facebook because I am sick of using social media, that identity is still mine. So you are empowering, unleashing the person potential to exploit its own identity. So that's the idea of the transhuman code. And then we analyze how that will affect each of the sectors of the economy, how that will, uh, uh, how, how will affect education, new paradigm shift for education, because if you are a qualified uh, identity, you can do a remote learning, you can get credits remote, education will become totally virtual using a video conferencing, which is a much more effective tool than just going people to campus. It will be more global health will be totally disrupted. You don't have to centralize health. The data on your health does not belong to the hospital, belongs to you. So if you change doctor, you carry with your health data. You don't need to ask permission to your doctor to move the data. So that's the kind of the disruption the transhuman code is defined. The good news, the technology is there. As I said before, the convergency of technology is accelerating this process. The fact that COVID has um, illustrated a major issue, which is, the countries that they were not ready to fight COVID actually were countries that they were not ready on their digital transformation. That's what's been number one criteria, right? Countries with a strong digital transformation, uh, an extension of the digital transformation in an inclusive way so their entire population benefits from that, they move away from the COVID situation very, very fast. I mean, you can see that in Switzerland, right? Or, or in Norway, or in Finland, or in Estonia, countries then they are 100% digitalized. So um, so that's the, uh, that, that, that's the uh, objective, and, and that objective will change the architecture to the internet. Uh, you know, I have been, uh, as you guys, because we are all uh, been working in bigger organizations, I was in the UN for so many years, and there was always the same debate between countries, between enterprises. How can we reduce cyber attack? How can we empower our uh, organization? How can we reduce damages? The problem we have is that there's more money on the attack than is on the defense. Substantially more. I mean, you just need to go to the dark web and see how much uh, people are willing to pay for your mailing list or even for this conference mailing list, right? And how they will do that in an anonymous way using cryptocurrency so they are, it will be impossible to track. Until we don't solve that anonymity problem that we are facing, all this discussion of cybersecurity will be will be totally relevant. We have to we have to add that layer to the internet. Thank you, Carlos. Just uh, in the interest of time, um, I wanted to say if uh, um, you, you all have any reaction to to, to Carlos's uh, comments. Well, I, I mean, I just say, look, that's that's very ambitious and an interesting uh, poss- potential solution for part of this. It has, as, as Carlos said, lots of second order issues that have to be looked at, um, you know, in terms of public interest, too. I mean, you're just erasing everything from someone. If they're newsworthy, there's issues that, the, with, you know, how privacy is balanced with public needs and other things. But, but I'd say that's, that's, that's part of it. And I, and I also say, look, in the U.S., there is likely to be great resistance to that because the idea of any kind of national ID is still anathema. Whether it should be or not, it is in the U.S. Um, you know, and that's just rooted in the way people think. Um, so even though everyone has driver's license, they don't like the idea of a national ID. We explored this when I was at the White House with something called, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, sort of a digital identity initiative where we give people benefits if they, they uh, took this. But, it, you know, I, I just don't see that something, it's something that's going to sweep the nation anytime soon. Uh, the other the thing I, I guess I just wanted to add quickly is that, um, you know, another issue of this, and you mentioned this, is a lot of countries don't have the, the resources, don't have the organization. You know, Switzerland, the U.S. and others are pretty advanced. And the U.K. is pretty advanced. But a lot of countries don't. And I think part of the solution to this really is treating this more as a development agenda, you know, just not cybersecurity, 
but to work with a lot of yeah. these developing company countries so that they have national strategies, they have uh, certs, they have institutions. Uh, this is good for their economy. It's good for their business. Uh, everyone, uh, everyone around the world wants to do digital digital transformation, but you have to build in cybersecurity, and and you're planning as part of that, and that's bringing these communities together and it's capacity building. Which you know, running a capacity building organization, I can tell you that there's just not enough resources devoted to that. It's still seen as separate from the larger development goals. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have five minutes left. Um, I know that uh, several audiences are coming and going. Um, so if anybody has any questions for those who are listening, please feel free to drop drop the questions while we're continuing to, to have, uh, have the discussion. So just, just opening that up. Uh, but I do want to touch on one, one important aspect that both I think uh, Chris, you and John have brought this up um, in multiple occasions is why aren't you know the boards and even at the management level, uh, why isn't there enough, enough attention to cybersecurity and compliance in spite of everything that happens around us? I mean, nothing uh, gets that much attention, even from the media, from national media to local media these days. I mean, nobody talks about digital transformation, but everybody talks about cyber, <laughs> cybersecurity and attack. But in spite of that, the cybersecurity and compliance isn't becoming a culture of, of an organization. Um, so, you know, I would love to hear hear your thoughts. You know, maybe John, you can start and, and others can react. Thank you. This, my response to that is may sound like an excuse, but <laughs> the agenda at the top of these companies is formidable. Uh, you've got them dealing, for example, with uh, COVID. Uh, at the level of employee safety. Uh, you've got to deal nowadays in most corporations with a topic called ESG, uh, which has become gigantic. So to cram any space into a diary of the executives isn't easy. So that's kind of, that's by way of saying it ain't simple to get there. Uh, uh, that's where my bias is to have them go through an exercise at least once a year and participate and learn it on the ground. So I think for me, that's the way to do it, is to have them realize that in business and in their homes, they need better security. And uh, what, what I do think about Santosh is what can we learn from this COVID event? Because in a sense, it's a story in two parts, a story of technology and a story of behaviors. And the technology has come a long way quickly in the West, but not elsewhere. But the behaviors, I would say, an observer in the US would say, well, all over the place. Uh, Sweden, very interesting model. Taiwan, different model. And I, I think it's worthwhile just interrogating because that's in the UK, I'll observe in the UK, we had quite a few people who were hesitant early on. And what it meant was, People have been communicating better with these communities, these areas, and suddenly they're queuing up in the streets to get it done. And now we're reaching very, very big numbers. So there's a part, of, there's a big opportunity on the behavioral side here, I think, and we have to think of that in a context of the, each of the big companies or corporations so it becomes real. I, you know, you. I, 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 I agree every, with everything, John. I just, I'd add that it's, you know, it goes back to this issue of, of it not being mainstream, this issue. I mean, at, at base for a company, this is a risk management issue, just like any other risk management issue they deal with. But because they think of cyber as this difficult thing, they don't treat it that way. Um, and it becomes this binary thing where if everything's okay or seemingly okay, the CISO, the chief information security officer gets to keep their job. If it's not, they get fired. That's ridiculous. That doesn't happen anywhere else. So so it's demystifying it a little bit. It's making them understand it's just another risk and they have to plan for it. And they have to understand that they may not see the losses. You know, when your trade secrets walk out the door, it, you don't see the losses immediately until they get copied and used. So you have to start thinking about it. Uh, and, this uh, risk yeah. risk. and we're getting there. We're getting there. Thank, you. Thank, you Thank, you Thank you for that. I think we're almost we're at the almost tail end. I'll, I'll quickly, again, thank yeah, you, again, thank you everybody thank for sharing your thoughts. Your thoughts. Definitely it's valuable. I've definitely learned quite a bit here. Um, we have, uh, um, one, we more have one more minute, or maybe, 
all of us can quickly go around and, and, and have our closing comments. So we'll start with Carlos, you. So, yeah, so fully agree with the panelists on, on the need of advance in the uh, regulatory aspects. Also, uh, describe what cyber threat is, because as Chris say, it can, it can be something very simple to solve versus something that is actually related to communication in the way we communicate it. I think there are areas where cyber uh, security and cyber mm, weapons are more concentrated, which we didn't cover a lot here. So maybe more technical, it's like the dark web and everything going on there. I think especially scrutiny needs to happen there. And uh, the role of international organizations in creating some standard, and maybe they even they need to create a focal point that we have uh, WHO for health, we have ITU for telecommunication. We don't really have an international cybersecurity body yet in place. Uh, and, and, and the problem is big enough maybe to think about it, how to bring countries together in, and discuss this in a regular basis. Thank you, Carlos. Chris, over to you. You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, I, I'd say, uh, look, it comes down to more attention and mainstreaming this issue in our foreign policy and our economic policy and our national security policy and treating it with the uh, You know, I think 